Um, who are Enactus UK? Well, um, Enactus UK are the UK's largest youth social action and youth social enterprise charity. We are based uh, as a global organization um, in 35 different countries across the world. But today we're talking about the United Kingdom, uh, where we're coming from you now. Um, what we do is develop young people in those universities across the country. Uh, we're in 60. Um, so when you're uh, at university, you go to your SU and you have your kind of uh, Quidditch societies, your Corfball societies, netball societies. You also have Enacta societies. And in that society, what you do is you work with your fellow students to find out issues in your local area that you are passionate about and develop social action and social innovation projects to tackle those issues. So as you can see from the slide, we want to develop that national network of socially minded young leaders um, to transform uh, communities through real life social action and environmentally responsible enterprise. So there are many reasons why students would want to join uh, their enacted society. We boil it down to, uh, into three uh, kind of key ones. Uh, they are, of course, to uh, make friends. Um, it's a fantastic society to, to meet sort of like-minded people who are passionate about the same things that you are uh, and meet, uh, meet friends. It's always a big deal when people first go to university um, or even later on in university. I myself um, joined a society in my third year and met a whole bunch of friends who are now my friends for life. Uh, so it's never too late to do that. Secondly, it's an opportunity. We give you the power. We give you the uh, funding and ability to tackle issues in your local communities that you are passionate about. So it's a great opportunity to join if you have that burning desire to, uh, to, to really help out those in your local community on issues that are important to you. And then last and certainly not least, um, and, and act as we're passionate about working with our own corporate partners to help you to develop your own uh, personal uh, leadership skills, communication skills, really improve your employability and help you land uh, the graduate job that you want to land. Um, and get where you want to go in life. We provide lots of opportunities uh, in conjunction with our partners um, to develop uh, you and your, and your skills. Uh, and this today is an example of just that. Um, so I think you've heard enough from me, um, but if you would like to join an actress, feel free to go ahead and scan that QR code. Uh, it will take you directly to our uh, website. Anshul uh, will also be popping a link to join in the chat as well. Um, but without any further ado, it's my pleasure to uh, hand over to uh, Sean from Carlisle Break and Friction. Uh, thank you, Charlie. Thank you for that introduction and uh, welcome everybody uh, that's here live and those that are uh, watching the recording after. Uh, my name is Sean Carey. I'm director of R&D for uh, Carlisle Break and Friction. Um, we are a manufacturing company based in the UK, uh, in South Wales. Our specialists are manufacturing brake systems for some of the most challenging uh, vehicle applications uh, in the world. And so I'm gonna to start today by a little bit more about our company uh, and about the importance um, of STEM to our company and then talk about interviewing and how to stand out in the interview process. The focus here is on STEM, but if you're not specifically in the STEM career, I think some of these, some of these points will uh, be uh, relevant to you as well. Um, it's even more relevant uh, to us, Carlisle, right now, because we're actively uh, recruiting uh, in different parts of our business. There's a real focus on this process and these uh, projects for us uh, right now as well. So without further ado, let me share my screen. Talk through some materials here, and uh, I'm, I'm gonna not read these slides out to you. We're gonna talk about them, uh, and uh, we can have some questions at the end, so hopefully, Screen sharing, it looks like I am. Um, so that's great. Okay, so STEM and employability. First things first, who are we at Carlisle Break and Friction? As I said, we're a manufacturing company with a global footprint uh, across the Americas, Europe, uh, and Asia. We specialize in braking systems. So it's things like uh, brake calipers, friction material, hydraulics, uh, all the components that go into uh, brake systems, some examples of which I'm showing you here on the screen. Um, the bottom of the screen, you'll see a, a little focus on our location in the UK, where we are the uh, Mechatronics uh, Center of Excellence for the company. Um, we manufacture here 
uh, master cylinders, slave cylinders, brake boosters, um, and then we do engineering for uh, all the products that you see on the screen. Um, that's design engineering, uh, test and development engineering, manufacturing engineering and quality, um, all taking place here in Pontypool in the UK. Um, and as I said, uh, we're located in South Wales in Pontypool. We have roughly 100 employees. Those figures go up and down, but roughly 100 to 120 employees is the norm for us. Um, and we ship uh, over 200,000 products a year uh, in, in brake cylinders, as well as additionally some uh, brake products uh, that we ship to our uh, customers. Um, just some of the, just a little closer look at some of the products we make. You see things, uh, these are all for industrial, agricultural, construction, mining type applications. We don't do brake systems for passenger cars or trucks and buses. Uh, we specialize in uh, the industrial and um, off-road type of applications. That's really where our, our knowledge and our capabilities are. Um, brake cylinders of different types, um, parking brakes, service brakes, large oil immersed, uh, wet brake assemblies, uh, and then electrohydraulic brake systems for some of the more advanced uh, type of um, braking systems that are in development today. And if these aren't familiar products to you, that's okay. Uh, they're not the sort of things that you see a lot of. Um, usually these are parts that are attached to the brake pedal, uh, which you don't really get to see much of uh, or down in the wheel end. And of course, these are for uh, some very, very special and, and high performing types of machines. Um, typical applications for us would be uh, agriculture, farm tractors, uh, construction equipment like backhoe loaders and tippers, uh, and then the very large uh, mining type of trucks, which are you know, able to carry three or 400 tons of material at a time uh, in a mine anywhere in the world. Those are the types of applications really specialize. Um, as far as the, the engineering expertise, which is the function that I'm responsible for uh, in Pontypool and in, in the USA, um, you know, it really all starts with the customer, understanding what the customer needs um, and trying to find just the right solution for them through either our current products um, or developing a new product. Uh, it all depends really on what the customers want and their timeframes. In the engineering process, we start with the customer's requirements, we analyze it, we come up with a mathematical representation or understanding of what the customer wants and what that means for a product. We will undertake uh, concept design using uh, 3D CAD, we use uh, Creo is our tool, um, creating a concept that has all the functions, uh, doing some simulation uh, to make sure that the concept is going to function the way uh, we intended to and meet the customer's requirements. After that, we make prototypes, bring them into the test lab, and we test them um, on benches or in environmental chambers, or in some cases, take them onto vehicles uh, and conduct testing um, at uh, various locations uh, ourselves around the UK or in conjunction with our customers at their own engineering centers. Um, in operations, we manufacture uh, these hydraulic components, uh, hundreds of thousands a year. Uh, I'm sorry, hundreds of thousands each year. Um, we have great capability in CNC machining with uh, quality control at every step of the way. Uh, we have CNC lathes that do very complex turned parts at a, at a very impressive rate of speed. Um, we've got robotic inspection stations. We do fine honing, which gives us exactly the right surface finish that we need inside these hydraulic components, um, uh, a complete wash plant to make sure that all the machined components are completely clean before we take them into to assemble. Uh, we have a flexible uh, and complete assembly uh, hall, which we configure to whatever sort of product is going through there uh, on any shift. And then, of course, the quality labs, uh, in addition to all the built-in step-by-step uh, -step quality through the processes. We have a quality lab to um, inspect every sort of component, be it a rubber component, um, a bought-in machined component, or the components that we machine uh, on our own CNC machining centers. STEM is uh, really vital 
to the types of work that we do at Carlisle. Uh, you know, the roles for STEM uh, are obvious in things like the mechanical engineering and design or the manufacturing engineering, but STEM is important at every process um, through, you know, assembly and test, quality, uh, inspection, even, you know, when you think about it, it includes our IT functionality, our finance uh, and logistics. Everyone uh, really is using those STEM subjects and techniques uh, to keep our business uh, running. And it's also important, obviously, to fuel our growth and bring about new products. So the subject is important for us. And like I said, everyone in our business touches it, uh, the, the STEM subject matter one way or another. Um, and beyond us, you know, for you, for those of you that are in studies and, and potentially in the STEM, uh, you know, course uh, or degree program, you know, every, so many industries rely on, on science and technology and mathematics um, in, in our modern world, be it a technical type of field in, related to product development, manufacturing, or into more of the human facing sides of careers and studies like, you know, health, medical, utilities, environment, et cetera, you know, STEM as a collection of studies is, uh, is really vital to understanding and, and progressing things uh, in our modern world. So the theme of today's uh, talk was really about how to stand out in the crowd. And I'm, I'm doing that, I'm, I'm, ta I'm talking about that subject from my own perspective as a director of R&D, as a mechanical engineer, um, a people manager, a functional manager, and um, sometime, you know, product development uh, type of engineer. Um, and I'm also, as I said before, we're actively uh, recruiting right now. So these are, these are observations and subjects that are really near and dear to what I do on a daily basis uh, today, uh, uh, right now. Um, so some of the key things about, you know, getting into the interviewing stage uh, and, and having discussions with potential employers um, is you not only need to understand yourself, but you need to understand the company that you're going to be discussing, you know, talking to, meeting with, visiting, um, do some research on them and, and understand what they do. Look at not only what they do, what their products are, their, their capabilities, look at their customers as well. Most, most companies like to brag about who their customers are. Um, and, and understanding what their customers do will give you an even better understanding about what's important to a potential employer. Um, when you're in your interviewing stage, whether it's by phone or Teams, Zoom, or in person, you know, really don't be bashful, don't hold back. I, I tend to encourage people to really brag, talk about yourself, talk about what you know, what you've done, what you can do, talk about your vision, your ambitions, you know, don't, don't be bashful, let people really know um, what you want and, and what you know and what you're all about. Um, share your experience as openly as you can. You, you, you have done obviously coursework when you're getting later in your degrees, you'll be doing projects and those things are great foundations and great points to discuss and make connections with the people that are, that are interviewing you. And you can obviously, before the interview even begins, try to make those connections in advance as you've done your research on a company, find ways to connect that to your experience, your, whether it's your coursework, your personal interests, maybe outside um, you know, hobbies and interests or, uh, or university projects. You know, the more connections that you can bring, the better the impression that you'll make uh, on, the, on the interviewers. Um, I always uh, encourage people to be ready to demonstrate what you know, demonstrate your grasp, demonstrate your ability. Um, if the opportunity presents, it really depends obviously on the, on the interview and what's happening, but don't be afraid to pick up a pencil and, and start to solve a problem on a piece of paper or draw a diagram to uh, help illustrate or get the point across. If there's a whiteboard in the room, um, don't be afraid to use it when the opportunity presents itself. These are things that one can help you communicate, but two can help make an impression on the people that you're talking to. Um, just to go a little bit further, if you're if you're studying a, a 
technical degree or whatever the degree is that you're you're studying you want you really want to show people that you're connected to show the interviewers the hiring managers the human resource uh, people what is your connection to the field so the deeper the stronger the connection the, again the better the impression the stronger the impression that you'll make on the people that are interviewing you um, bring examples of your work whether it's coursework project work or maybe something that you've done as a um, maybe in a, in a in year in industry or as an in internship, if you can show an example of your own work, that really makes a big impression on people that are that are interviewing you. And I guess the next subject here is understand how important you, you know be able to tell your the interviewers how important your degree is to what they want. You know, you're bringing knowledge, you've learned, um, hopefully you've, you've done some research. Tell people how you're going to be able to, tell the interviewers how you're gonna be able to bring that on day one um, to the position. How you're gonna be able to use everything that you've learned up to that point to build relationships, grow your understanding, learn key knowledge about the business or its products or its services, um, you know, how you're going to become a, a really good team member or a good employee, uh, you know, whatever, the, whatever the context is. Um, talk about why you chose, why did you get into a particular field of study and why do you want to go pursue that kind of a career? Um, again, the deeper that you can show that connection, the more you can get that across to the, to the interviewers, that you're talking to, the better uh, the impression, the better the connection. And I, and I would say, I mean, obviously we can't guarantee it, but the better chances that you move forward in the next stages of the process. Um, this is, uh, yeah, my, my, my example here, and I guess some of my firsthand example and something that we do at Carlisle as we're interviewing is um, be prepared to be put on the spot and asked to solve a problem that's relevant to the field that you are um, pursuing. As, a, as I've gone through my career and interviewed with a number of different companies, I have uh, been asked to take um, about a 45 minute engineering exam before the interview process starts. Um, I've been asked to analyze a blueprint and uh, a, you know, a drawing of a, of a, I think it was a gearbox of some sort. Uh, analyze it and try to find potential problems. Uh, I've been asked to write a general equation of the forces on a on a truck and be able to predict the loading on all the wheels um, and just without preparation, just been put on the spot and asked to do those things. Um, you won't always be prepared in advance with everything. Um, so be ready. Brush up, understand the fundamentals about the subject matter that you're studying, whether it's Mechanical engineering, electrical engineering, chemical, computer, you know, uh, various aspects of the sciences, you know, be ready to get specific and tackle some problems. Um, because people will want to know where you are with your knowledge. Um, and are you, and beyond that, they want to know how you react under pressure. So if that type of situation should arrive, stay calm. Uh, think about what you need step by step. And, and, and manage the pressure, use the techniques that you will have employed or used during your course of study, and just, just work it through the best you can. Uh, people are looking for not only technical um, ability, but they're also looking to deal with how, uh, they're looking to understand how you deal with pressurized situations. So that's a, that's a theme that has come up multiple times over my career. And it's a tool that we use uh, in, my, in my company, in my role. We, we want to understand how people solve problems, how they deal with stress uh, and pressure, and also how good is their grasp of the fundamentals of the field that we are interviewing for. And I do believe that is the end of everything that I've prepared uh, for this uh, session, so I'm happy to uh, open it up to some questions, Charlie. Yeah, of course, absolutely. Thank you so much, Sean. Um, if you've got any questions uh, for Sean, please do uh, pop them into the chat. Um, it will be great to see, uh, or raise your hand if you'd like to, uh, to speak 
uh, to speak up out loud rather than put it in the chat. That's absolutely fine too. Um, I wonder, Sean, if you could um, uh, offer sort of like, what was your kind of like one, if you had to give sort of one piece of advice to somebody who was kind of maybe a bit nervous about exploring more practical careers in STEM, what would you, how would you advise them? To, uh, let's see, nervous about exploring practical careers in STEM. Well, again, if, you, if you're nervous about it, that's a, that's a form of energy, right? That, that nervousness is a, it's an energy. Use that to either prepare, um, right? And, and try to eat, whether it's through research or some revision of subject areas, um, use it to uh, focus on a problem that might be put in front of you. Um, the key thing is when, you, when you're feeling that type of, uh, feeling like you're in that condition, in that position, is try to stay calm. <laughs> stay calm. Remember that everyone that's in that room is a human being too. They've all probably been in a certain, in a similar situation. So they will have a certain amount of empathy um, for you. Obviously they're wanting to, get the measure of a person. Um, so, you know, don't feel the pressure to have an answer straight away. Um, don't be afraid to ask a question to either clarify or, um, you know, maybe uh, buy yourself a little bit of time perhaps. <laughs> Uh, we've got a kind of related question actually in in the chat from uh, Shaz Rabello. What can you do to become calmer? So, what can you do to become calmer and react more appropriately under pressure? Okay, uh, yeah, it's you know it's it's an easy thing to say. It's a hard thing to do. Um, you, you so you have to you have to believe in yourself for one, right? You have to believe that you've got to that stage on on your merit, right? Because of everything you've done before and that you've you've got the knowledge through your studies or through your experience to get you to that stage. So have some belief in yourself. Um, the next thing is to realize that uh, getting the, the perfectly correct answer to something like that is not always the goal. Um, oftentimes it's the process. So begin the process. Begin by asking a clarifying question. Begin by stating your assumptions. Begin by asking for some resources. Do you need a pencil and paper? Do you need a whiteboard? Take control of the situation uh, so that you can get from point A to point B. Um, again, people wanna see what your behaviors are. They're not always looking for the right answer. So maybe take a few deep breaths as well to just calm yourself physically so that you can then focus on, on what you need to do. Taking a few deep breaths, absolutely. That's something that I do when I'm feeling nervous about something. Just a few slow deep breaths can help can help a lot, uh, a lot with that. Um, oh, yeah. I wonder, I've just got I've just got um, another question actually about um, what it's like to work. Like, do you? And this is maybe a bit more of a kind of your take on things, but do you personally prefer to work kind of in a smaller team or as part of a larger kind of wider organization? Ah. Uh. That's a great question. And we ask that in interviews all the time. <laughs> I personally, if I'm honest with myself, my tendency is to work alone. Um, but I know that to be successful in my role uh, and also to have been successful over my career, you, you have to be able to work in teams, uh, whether they're teams of, or, you know, it can be small teams, you and one other person or, or big teams. Um, so it's okay, you know, I have a preference. I think I have maybe it's not a preference, but maybe a personality type uh, that tends to, I like to focus. I like to have quiet and focus on a problem, see it through, get it finished. But that's, um, it's not always possible. It's not always practical and it doesn't always lead to the right outcome. So uh, for, for me, it's uh, to make a, make a little extra effort to be inclusive. Uh, reach out to additional resources, get different perspectives, join in in a, in a team type of approach when it's called for. Uh, you, you, yeah. I've, uh, I'll, I'll relay a little bit of a, maybe a little personal anecdote, but in, a, in one job I had in the, in the States for a large defense contractor, uh, I'd, I'd gone from working in a relatively small team at one employer, joined this company, and what I didn't know uh, until 
I was told I had to go do it was uh, they had uh, a weekly, what they call like a digital mock-up. Um, and it was the entire project team or uh, was brought into what it essentially was an auditorium. So there was probably 75 people in the room. Um, everyone sat, everyone's got a microphone and you are put on the spot by the project leaders to give an update about what you're doing. You might put, uh, you might have to ask somebody to put a CAD image up on a screen and you've got to talk your way through it uh, without a lot of preparation. And um, for somebody who likes to work uh, sort of solo, work in a small sort of context, having to put it all out there in front of all of these people, many of whom I did, had never met before, I didn't know, they were all, we all worked for the same company, but in many different departments, uh, that, that was quite a shock and that uh, took some getting used to, but eventually you realize we're all having to do the same thing. Everybody here is expected to do the same thing and it's accountability, it's communication, um, and it's an essential way to, to, to move a project forward. So as much as I have a, let's say a, a tendency, you've got to take yourself outside your comfort zone and, and be okay with it. Yeah, we've got a couple of um, great questions off the back of that as well, actually. Uh, one from Gabby, who says, how would you suggest to answer technical questions in an interview if you think you have no idea what the question is about? I feel like we've all been there <laughs> in an interview. Um, what, what advice would you give there? Like when you really have no clue what, what the question's about, how do you go about answering it? Well, if you know what, if you, if you don't know what the question's about, don't try to fake it. Um, just be honest. You know, tell, tell the, the, the interviewer, whoever's asking the question, tell them you, you don't understand the question. Maybe you can find a way to understanding through a, maybe a different way of asking or getting some clarifying assumptions, simplifying assumptions. Um, but if it's subject matter that you don't know, I mean, what can you do? You don't know it. So you just have to be honest and say, I really don't have the knowledge on that subject to be able to answer that question. You, you just have to, you have to be honest about it. And another question from Shaz, do you prefer it when someone's more detailed and takes their time to complete tasks or someone who is efficient and meets deadlines quickly, but may not be as detailed? Mm. Can I have both? <laughs> yeah, you get two, two team members, one of you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, well, you know, the fact of the matter is, in the work that we do in my company, uh, the attention to detail is absolutely essential. Uh, so I would rather have, I would rather take more time and, and have a person get through the details and get the answer right um, than hit a deadline um, with something that may not be completely correct because in our, in our business, we make great products. Um, so we've got to get it right because every time an operator puts their foot on the brake pedal, that vehicle has got to stop. Uh, so we can't afford things to be approximate in our business. Um, another another um, important factor in the kind of work that we do is uh, it takes a long time to make a prototype. So if we make a prototype and the facts aren't 100%, we may lose 12 weeks uh, of, of time in a project um, having to do it a second time. Uh, remaking things, especially with the way the economy is right now um, and the way businesses are, it's, uh, it's very difficult and very expensive and time consuming to do things a second time. I'd rather take a little bit more time up front, get it right. Um, it's it's going to save us in the long run. Excellent. Yeah, I mean, I think we have a saying at Enactus, um, which is that 80% uh, undone is better than 100% and not done. But I think this might be one of those times when that definitely does not apply. Yeah, <laughs> and, I didn't, at... I, and I didn't want to answer it that way, because really, the answer to that question is, it depends. Yeah, right. If it's the detailed design of a brake valve, I need to have it 100% correct. If it's a presentation about, uh, you know, some some new supplier or some, or maybe some new technological subject, or maybe a, maybe a business update. I think it's, I'm happier with the 80% solution. Um, I had a um, conversation with a student the other day who said that um, they're studying um, mechanical engineering. And they were saying that um, they were, when they were kind of looking at uh, roles to apply for and, and 
organizations that dealt with specific uh, elements of manufacturing in engineering, they kind of thought to themselves that they weren't confident applying for them because they hadn't necessarily specifically studied exactly what that organization made or what mm. they what mm-hmm. they feared. How would yeah. you what would you say to a student who's maybe unsure, even though they did study mechanical engineering at, at university? Yeah, well, you know, uh, you know, the university studies can only take you so far. Uh, they give you the fundamentals and you may along the way focus on subject A or subject B. Uh, but when you get into industry, industries become very specific. Uh, our company, our products have been um, our brake valves and our technology and our brake valves has been matured over 30 plus years of, of development and experience. You're not going to, nobody's going to learn though that type of detail in a university course ever. Um, so don't worry about that. Um, what we like to do is find people who have a good grasp of the fundamentals uh, and show a good willingness to learn new things and extend, basically extend what you already know into, um, uh, into the right sort of focus or the right specific set of knowledge uh, that we need. Um, you know, mechanical engineering is a good one because there's, it's so grounded in the basic physical world that usually you're very well prepared to understand most things. Um, and I've seen that in some of the, the, the young engineers that we've hired over the last few years have been able to take and apply the fundamentals that they learned in university, apply it to our products and, and actually improve our understanding and, and leap us forward to where we were before. Um, so there's a lot of power in um, applying all of that education to the products that you'll find at any company because you're coming at it with a new perspective, you're coming at it with a fresh set of eyes and also a fresh, um, uh, let's say, you're, you're closer to the theory and the fundamental uh, you know, equations and, and everything that you can look at a problem differently than, than a more seasoned, experienced uh, engineer can sometimes. And it's very refreshing and it, it can be very, very beneficial. So don't, I would say, don't worry about it. Trust what you've learned and just be willing to keep learning. Just, just on that point, actually, do you find that obviously because the industry has kind of developed technologically speaking such a significant, you know, in, in a significant way over the last however many years that some of the stuff that young that kind of students come in with is is very very different to maybe what you would have been taught thirty years ago. Um, I, I don't think I don't think it's that different because the fundamentals are still there. You know the equations of motion, the equations of fluid dynamics, um, thermal dynamics, um, heat transfer, mass transfer. Those things all still work. Um, the, the things that uh, in companies really develop are the rules and the limits around those things uh, that ensures you get a good product. Um, if you take the big automotive companies, whether it's Renault, Nissan, Ford, et cetera, they have really strict processes to make sure the right steps get done. But inside each one of those steps, the same type of engineering is still being applied. Uh, well, in, in any of the domains, whether it's computer or electrical or mechanical, um, and it's the same for us. You know, we have we have certain rules that we apply, strengths, if you will, that said it takes this type of control to make the product work properly. But the fundamental engineering still applies to every single part that we put into a brake valve. Cool. I think uh, we're all out of uh, questions there. So uh, thank you very, very much, Sean. That was absolutely fantastic. Such a great insight into uh, into the industry. And, and I think it's going to be really helpful for uh, for all the students to kind of understand how they can kind of translate that uh, their STEM degree and how that translates into the working world and what, what it's going to be like moving into that moving into that environment um, beyond beyond academia. So thank you very, very much for that. Um, as I said uh, earlier, if you enjoyed uh, this session, if you enjoy sessions like this, um, please, please tune in to um, uh, the Employability Summer Series. Remember, as always, the uh, recordings are available afterwards. So if you miss something or you want to you wanna grab it, uh, watch it again, you can do on our site. They're always available 24 hours after 
after they were originally uh, broadcast, if that's the right word. Um, <laughs> so uh, once again, thank you very much uh, uh, to Sean um, and Carl, our Breaking Friction as well uh, for the session this afternoon. Um, it was absolutely fab and uh, good afternoon, everybody. We will see you on the next one. Take care uh, and have a, have a great day. Thanks everybody. Good luck to you all. Bye. See you later. Bye now.